Monica Pearson, one-on-one, -on -one, sponsored by Mont Lick Injury Attorneys. My first guest tonight is a member of the award-winning Zach Brown Band. John Driscoll Hopkins is more than a bass player. He's a songwriter, a vocalist, a music producer, and a fighter, but not in the boxing ring. He is in a fight for his life and the lives of others who have Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. It's a disease of the nervous system that causes loss of muscle control and cannot be cured. But don't say that to Hopkins, who still is on the road with the band and raising awareness and money for ALS. I went one-on-one -on -one with him at his home in Cobb County to talk about music and his mission. You know. John Driscoll Hopkins' music and recording studio at home is chocked full of equipment and instruments, including lots of guitars. He comes by his love of music naturally. My mother is a ballerina. My dad is a trumpet player with a, an outstanding singing voice in the choir and I think we grew up in a time where I was allowed to be in music especially in Atlanta and in the southeast if you are able to play a guitar and sing songs you can get work and you have to hustle but you can get work. I started at, at at Florida State with a theater degree. Which surprised so, me. <laughs> yeah, I've been acting like a musician for a long time. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> I didn't really uh, go into acting right away because I was already playing music and, and I was uh, sort of in that community in Tallahassee. And then when we moved back to Atlanta, uh, I jumped into that community as well. Well, what I love, we're here in your studio and it is simply amazing. But I want to go back to how did you and Zach Brown get together? So in the 90s, Buckhead, as you remember, was a hot spot for, uh, it was almost like Bourbon Street. Yeah. And um, there were five blocks stacked up with restaurants and bars where uh, a person who played acoustic guitar um, could work five nights a week. And I was one of those people. Um, Tuesdays at CJ's Landing, which was known for reggae, among other things, they had an acoustic guitar porch. On Tuesdays, I would run their open mic night I was 27 when a 20-year-old Zach Brown showed up at my open mic night and performed very well. And I didn't see him for two years, I think. And then he needed recording. And that was my other... Side hustle. Yes, my <laughs> side hustle. What I love about the way you play is so reminiscent. I'm from Kentucky, so I'm used to that bluegrass mm -hmm. sound. I'm used to those Bill Monroe sounds. Oh yeah. And you play a lot of that. Where did you pick that up? I think the first song I ever learned on guitar was Do Lord. And Gainesville is the foothills of the Appalachians. And we often would go to Asheville, North Carolina, and bluegrass is rampant in North Carolina. And we grew up going to church camp in Black Mountain and Ridgecrest, North Carolina. And we were inundated with a lot of these um, Southern Baptist gospel songs. And I think it was a very short jump to bluegrass for most of us. Zach grew up in Dahlonega and his brother is a big bluegrass fan. And he and his dad and his brother used to go to North Carolina and go to Merle Fest <clears throat> right outside of Boone. And I think bluegrass speaks to us in the way that it is so complex 
in its simplicity. Mm -hmm. Chicken Fried was the Zac Brown Band's first big hit. Up next, John Driscoll Hopkins explains why that song is still so popular, and he talks about the band's foray into heavy metal. Plus, we catch up with Jerry O'Connell during his game show hosting gig in Atlanta. You know what, I'm a chicken fried. Cold beer on a Friday night. A pair of jeans that fit just right. And the radio. The song Chicken Fried is the gift that keeps on giving. And it has a lot to do with the lyrics like no dollar sign on peace of mind. Why do you think that hit a chord, that song hit a chord with so many people? It speaks to the simple things in life that that we can all relate to. And then there is a patriotic element in the third verse that really struck a chord with our military uh, around the world. And that has been um, still, um, people ask you, do you get tired of playing chicken fried? And, and my answer is a resounding no, because it's second nature in our hands and voices, but the reaction is uh, incredible and unique every night. I mean, you've got what, 153 million views of chicken fried yeah. on YouTube. It is a phenomenon and we are blessed to have it. You know, Zach wrote that song with Wyatt Durrett back in late 90s, early 2000s, and we put it on that 2003 homegrown release when it was Zach Brown. And um, it was later re recorded for the foundation with Zach Brown Band. And um, it's a small distinction there, but um, we sort of modeled our career after the Dave Matthews Band in that we were all involved in the sound. And um, Zach still writes most of the songs and we chime in, but the sound is a cohesive unit. Whenever one of us is sick and can't come to a show, we definitely notice a gaping hole in, in that sound. Another song I want to talk about, you co-wrote Toes in the Water, Ass in the Sand. <laughs> now, where did that come from? <laughs> We've taught more five-year-olds how to say ass <laughs> than anyone in history, I believe. Um, Wyatt pioneered that one, too, and he was sitting after a long night with his toes in the water and ass in the sand, and he called Zach and said, we need to write this. And um, I was uh, lucky enough to be on the end of the arranging and added a, a few lines and, and revamped the chorus a bit. And that's the beautiful thing about being in Zach Brown Band is when you contribute to a song, you get credit for it. You know, uh, Zach is generous in that way and doesn't want to say, well, the song's already written, you know, it's my song. He says, well, you did that part and we're going to break off this piece. And, you know, everyone in the band has writing credit along the way somewhere. And um, that's important to us. Well, I know you co-wrote Heavy is the Head. And what was the I guess most touching for me, but also a concern for me, was the young man who did the song, Chris Cornell, ended up killing himself. Yeah, he had a very heavy crown. Um, he uh, dealt with depression, and um, the stories that I've heard were uh, that his immediate team knew he was off that night and he locked himself in his room. And by the time they could get to him, um, he was gone. But 
He was such a sweet guy. And we got to play Saturday Night Live with him. And he is by far one of my favorite voices in rock and roll. Soundgarden was a big, big part of my college music listening experience. We were in heavier bands in the early 90s. Um, we only came to country radio as a southern rock band because that's where the music that we were making fit. But most of us are rockers, blues rock, jazz rock, uh, jam band, and I this think, was heavy metal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This was heavy metal. And when I look at you, I don't think heavy metal. Yeah. Well, I, I'll show you pictures of my, when I had hair. <sighs> but uh, I used to have that Greg Allman one length long hair. At age 53, John Driscoll Hopkins still cherishes his first acoustic guitar, a Takamini, described in the industry as the hardest working guitar. He played piano since the fifth grade, but at 18, got his first guitar. This one has been signed by the Indigo Girls. Are you here? I love them. Yeah. And it's got a little spider web. Watch your keeper. Well, she um, is responsible for lots of songs. And <clears throat> these pig scars are just poor technique. Um, so when you were starting out? Yeah, I was wearing the guitar low like this and just hitting. Um, did you teach yourself to play? I did, yeah. Remarkably close to in tune. Give me a little something. <laughs> She still sounds good. Yeah. John is learning to live his life differently now that he's been diagnosed with ALS. How this terminal diagnosis is affecting the band and his family. His wife, Jen Hopkins, joins the conversation when One on One continues. It was 10 years ago, a lot of us were dumping ice cold water on our heads for the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge to raise awareness of ALS, a myotrophic lateral sclerosis. John and Jen participated. I did it too. Yeah, everybody did it. And, you know, I I did go, okay, what, what, is, this? what is this? I happened upon a couple that lived in Alpharetta and the husband had it and he was young. They had a short little film on it and that's why I became familiar with it. At that time, I'm like, oh my God. But of course you're like, never happened to me because you don't understand that it can happen to anybody. After the ice bucket challenge, I think it kind of died down, but there's been a resurgence. I think that that there is because it, it, it seems to be affecting everyone, even younger people, that there seems to be uh, more of a fight now to figure this out. And I think we're coming in at a, a pretty critical time, you know, that here's this rock star musician who has it, you know. And so I think that people are realizing now more than ever that it can affect anybody. But there are lots of things now being done. There's lots of research being done, although it's not comparable to cancer or anything like that. There are some really brilliant minds working on it. And now with AI technology being introduced and assistive technology, it's becoming a different, a different world for it. So we're very hopeful. 
Before there was hope, there were questions about what was happening to John's body. At first, doctors couldn't provide answers. The first doctor, um, the, the standard test for um, diagnosing AOS um, is called an EMG, and it involves electroshock. It's really fun. Um, they shock you. And then they put needles in your muscles and measure your electric uh, function with your muscles, um, how much energy your muscles are generating. And um, the first doctor did the shock therapy, which tests for neuropathy, but didn't do the needling. So I didn't have neuropathy and no one has ALS, right? So he just sent me on my way. The second doctor uh, gave me some advice about diet and exercise, but didn't see true ALS symptoms. Um, I'm a very slow progressor, so they were coming on very slowly. It was my primary care physician that said, you need to go see uh, another neurologist and rule out ALS. And he did the needling and the shock with the EMG. And we ruled it in. So um, <clears throat> it's a very broad disease and no two cases are exactly the same. Um, you know, it's not like breaking your arm where you just have one fix. Um, there are so many variations. So you were with him, I know. So when you got the well, diagnosis, I wasn't with him. It was Christmas time and the girls were out of school. And, um, when the, the neurologist said, we're just going to rule this out. Like we did not think for a second that that's what it was, but they had to you know, rule everything out. And this was one of the standard things that she was on the phone. I was on the phone yeah. when they called me. And your reaction? Um, I felt like I hit a brick wall. Like I was in such shock. Um, I knew what it was and was in complete disbelief and just, you know, it was I, I didn't even really know the the details of the disease. We had done the ice bucket challenge and um, Jen uh, being thorough as she is uh, read up on it and made sure that she was aware of what we were um, donating to and I was just like we're going to help people. Let's go on to the next thing and didn't even have any idea what was ahead of me but she did and um and i remember telling the doctor jen's very upset <clears throat> this is probably really bad and that's when he said average life expectancy is three to five years and that was not on my radar particularly with your three young girls yeah how did you all tell the girls about this diagnosis? We waited a while until we could um, fully comprehend what this meant, what um, we wanted to do our research, what options were out there to try to help him. Um, we had, we felt we needed to become okay with it so that we could not okay with it, but we had to understand it so that we could best explain it to them and uh, in a calm way, you know. Um, so we waited. It was February, right, when we finally were in the position to share with them. And what was their reaction to it? Because they're little girls. Well, we were actually, we had already told family. We had already told my band. Um, I mean, several bands we had told my musical oh, friends and you know all the people that were um that grew up uh with us and um 
and we were saving them for the end. And, and we were up at the, the neighborhood tennis court and we were in hitting volleyballs. I tripped on the asphalt and fell down. The girls gathered around. They were worried. And I said, you might have noticed that I'm unsteady and having trouble walking. And it's because I have a disease. They were big girls about it. They were strong. Um, they asked real questions. Could you die? Yes. Could you be in a wheelchair? Yes. You know, uh, I'm okay right now, and we're going to focus on today. And um, that was over two years ago. So they've thankfully had time to meet other people who are in chairs and some people who have had this disease for 20 years and are defying the odds. They understand that this is a big, uh, <clears throat> broad diagnosis, and uh, we are blessed to be here. I've met people who were diagnosed after me that are already gone. John is still touring with the Zach Brown Band. Up next, how ALS is affecting his performance and how his wife feels about him being on the road. John is on his third touring season with the Zac Brown Band since being diagnosed with ALS in 2021. Well, John pretty immediately felt that um, it was his responsibility. Since he is in the public eye and has a platform that he could possibly reach 20, 30,000 people a night and share witnesses, he immediately felt it was his responsibility and that, that that's what this meant for him. But for you as his wife, him going back on the road with ALS, were you in for it or were you against it? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, I feel like it. anyone that's facing uh, a situation like this, you could just got to keep going. You got to just keep going as long as you can. Keep moving. Keep pushing forward. And that's who he is. I mean, there's no stopping him <laughs> at anything. Mm -hmm. I, I do have issues sometimes with spending my time away from my girls, but sometimes I think being on the road allows me to continue to be on the road. You know, the, the act of doing, the getting out there and feeding off all this positive energy from the crowd is helping me. Is it helping me more than yoga every day? Maybe, maybe not, but I still feel this urge to create and to um, express, you know, we talk about the need for positive energy and this and other neurological disorders as being a, uh, a big proponent in people doing well. So positive energy, uh, as long as I can, I will. And that was my next question was, how long can you stay on the road? How has it affected your ability to perform? I have been um, singing pretty well. My speech is slower. I'm sure it's noticeable to everyone, but it's it's far slower than it used to be. But in terms of singing, when I have my part that comes around, generally I'm able to just chime in the way I've always done. Uh, and How about it, your picking? Well, <laughs> my picking has uh, changed. Uh, my double time on my right hand is non-existent. So I sing all the time. And... God willing, I will have time uh, if I need to. But I don't want to um, become a detriment to the quality of the band. And I don't think they would tell me 
if I if I were. So I I will be monitoring the mixes as we go, and as long as I'm singing it, I'm bringing it. So if the time comes where I have to to bow out, then I will do that for the the sake of the music. But so far. I've missed one or two performances and the overwhelming sentiment of the band is we notice a hole in the sound when you're not there. So I'm still playing my part. He also is writing music. He says about his own life experiences, about family, friends, or something that has happened to him. So have you written anything on ALS? I have, um, not directly, but I have a new song called I Love You Forever. The short explanation is when I was diagnosed on December 22nd of 2021, I got in the car and drove home and we had plans to go to Callaway Gardens at night and see the fantasy and lights which we do every year. Um, Jen and I were married there. And so it's this super amazing hokey experience where you either drive through and listen to the music or you get on the Jolly Trolley. And that year we were on the Jolly Trolley and we weren't jolly. (laughs) And I just was falling into this pit, um, this rabbit hole where I couldn't think of anything but but the diagnosis and how gruesome the future looked. And I <clears throat> thought about not being able to speak, not being able to sing, not being able to breathe. And I... Um, what do I tell these girls? What do I tell them that that um, could possibly help them along the way? And the only thing I could come up with was, I love you forever. And if I'm not able to speak, at least you know that. And the song... Um, grew into me singing about experiences that we haven't had yet. You know, my favorite line is, boys don't need nearly as much as they tell you. Patience is prudent when all hell breaks loose. You know, it's these little moments where it's like lessons, you know, Children need holding, even when scolding, that kind of thing. You know, they're young girls. And um, I grew up with three brothers. So, um, you know, I'm trying to be a girl dad in a situation where I don't know how long I will be able to openly communicate with them. So... That was the inspiration of that one. And there's another one called Each Other, which um, is all about family and the things that are most important. The girls, Grace, Hope, and Faith. When you pick those names, you had no idea. Without knowing the future, the, our, our choice with Grace, Faith, and Hope was sort of Um, when they were babies, I would call them the untouchables, you know, (laughs) and things like that, grace, faith, and hope are so present in my, in our lives, even if you can't touch them. And, um, and I just like the, uh, the idea that, that these girls bring that to us generally, Uh, in our lives outside of some ridiculous diagnosis um, they they are grace, faith and hope to us Um, and they are incredible 
Coming up, an exclusive performance from John Driscoll Hopkins. He gives us a sneak peek of one of his new songs when One on One continues. Plus, we go behind the scenes with Jerry O'Connell, who shares his love for Atlanta and one of his favorite restaurants in town. The bond between John and Jen provides them strength for his fight. We're a good team. We are a really good team. He definitely takes up the reins when I need him to. And in this, I have found a purpose, too. I think it's important. We both feel we need to do everything we possibly can. You all have been married how many years now? 15, 16, 16. <laughs> When you took those vows, for better or for worse, rich or poor, in sickness and in health. A reminder of that, it's a vow as often. <laughs> <laughs> didn't have I'm to. getting worse, so better or worse, do you remember that part? You know. He has this great sense of humor with all of this. <laughs> I think that's one of his amazing qualities that he brings. Even our friends, I think, are like, I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't, you know, what do I say? And, and, you know, how's he doing? I'm afraid to ask. But he just brings a lightness to it. He makes it okay to talk about. He lets everyone at ease. Um, he brings humor to it. But he also can be very serious. And he's the perfect spokesman, I, I feel. And and um, people say that everything you've been through in your life leads, you know, to the journey. And I think that... You know, he's had all these experiences in life that have helped him to be able to handle this with such grace and and strength. And so have you. Yeah. The love and support of his family is so encouraging and uplifting. And then there is his music. After his diagnosis, he wrote the new song titled Each Other with his daughters and family in mind. Each other 
Hop on a Cure will host Harmony for Hope on September 14th at Trillet Studios. For more information, go to hoponacure.org. Actor Jerry O'Connell is spending a lot of time in Atlanta, and he wants to give you an opportunity to make some money and win some prizes. I go one-on-one -on -one with him next. Actor Jerry O'Connell is a native New Yorker living in Los Angeles who has fallen in love with Atlanta, its people, food, and opportunities. I went one-on-one -on -one with him during a break from his hosting duties on the Pictionary TV game show. Things found under the sea. This would keep your team in it, Jaleel. Okay, 15 seconds on the clock. Sketch. The game show Pictionary is recorded at the Georgia Public Broadcasting Studios in Atlanta. Jerry O'Connell hosts a program that pits two teams, each led by a celebrity, against each other. O'Connell gives a player a word. They have to describe it with the drawing. They can't talk. Think of it as charades with drawings. The team with the most correct answers wins cash and possibly a trip. How many weeks do you spend in Metro Atlanta shooting the show? You know, we spend, um, you know, we spend a, a couple of months shooting, but we're actually here longer than that because um, there's so much preparation that goes into it. Mostly um, recruiting contestants. It's um, it's why I have to thank you for like coming here because uh, people of Atlanta, we need contestants. We want to give you money. We want to give you <laughs> prizes. All you have to do is be willing to show, show how well or how poorly you draw on national television. It's been really fun for us um, moving the show to Atlanta because um, people in Atlanta are nice. I'm just not used to people greeting me with smiles. <laughs> no offense to where I live or where I'm from. I don't want any beef, but um, People are polite. Uh, people call me sir. I, I can't believe it. I don't know what to do. You know, I have teenage daughters. I live in Los Angeles. No young people call me sir. Here in Atlanta, people call me sir. And you know what? I like it. I'm into it. Uh, I start, I'm, I'm now calling people sir and ma'am. I'm into it. Then there is the food. And the way we got here is because one of our photogs, wife, Nikki is at the Silver Skillet and you eat there at least twice a day? We shoot the show uh, here at Georgia Public Broadcasting uh, in Midtown. Um, and there is a, uh, there's a restaurant next door that only serves breakfast and lunch called the Silver Skillet. And I'm sorry to turn this into a Yelp review here, your interview, <laughs> but it is an incredible eating experience. I cannot tell you, I cannot say enough great things about the Silver Skillet. I order something different every time I go in there. You have to understand something else. I live in Hollywood. I live in Los Angeles. All we eat there is kale. All we <laughs> eat there is steamed vegetables. And now I eat biscuits with every meal. And by the way, I wanna say, I'm not gaining weight. I've never felt, I've never had more energy. I've never felt better. I went back to LA last weekend and I was like, I want a biscuit. Where is my biscuit with my meal? Where is my gravy? And they thought I was crazy. <laughs> and I let my family know I'm only eating at restaurants where they serve biscuits and gravy. I, um, your I, wife is going to have to learn how to make biscuits. I feel a new energy. <laughs> I feel a new energy uh, living here in Atlanta. It really is. Um, it really is fun. I go to Piedmont Park every day. I exercise there. It is such a gorgeous park. Um, I really, um, I really love Atlanta. I love the history of it. It's really funny. As a young man, uh, one of my first movies that I did was Scream Two, and we shot it all at Agnes Scott yes. College. And so we lived at Agnes Scott for the summer while we shot it there. And I was a much younger man then. And um, we uh, went out a lot in Buckhead and we uh, we had a really good time. So I don't remember really a lot from those days because I was working hard and playing even harder. Um, but uh, 
I did remember that we went a lot to Fat Matt's Rib Shack. And so <laughs> that was my first stop when I got on the plane. I was like, oh, where do I eat? Oh, yeah, Fat Matt's Rib Shack. And really happy to say nothing's changed there. I uh, had a slab and a half, which is more meat than I've ever eaten in my life. And uh, again, somehow not gaining weight. I feel stronger. I feel more virile. I just, I don't know. Uh, Atlanta really... It works. It works with me. Jerry's other Atlanta connection is Kenny Leon, former artistic director at the Alliance Theater, founder of True Colors Theater Company, and now an award-winning director and producer on Broadway and TV. Leon directed the Tony Award-winning play The Soldier's Play, starring Blair Underwood, David Allen Greer, and Jerry. Mr. Leon gave me a quote, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to you, uh, and I hope he doesn't get mad at me sharing his magic sauce but when we sat down to start rehearsals uh for a soldier's play which the great kenny leon of atlanta directed tony award-winning kenny leon um of atlanta directed he said uh i'm directing this i'm your director my job is to make sure that your next job is amazing. And I had never heard anyone say that. Think about that. Yes. This is your boss saying, I need everything out of you guys. You have to bring everything. Like, I need you to work hard. He said, my job is to make sure your next job is incredible. And I carry that with me everywhere. Everyone, uh, ever since I worked with Kenny Leon, everyone I come into contact with professionally, it is my job to make sure your next job is amazing. And that really, that really touched me. I really think about it. I think about it every moment I'm, I'm in a professional setting. Jerry and his wife, model and actress Rebecca Romine have two daughters, Charlie, named after his brother, and Dolly, named after Dolly Parton because of a visit to Dollywood. Dolly Parton saw my wife who was very pregnant at the time and said, oh, I'm gonna dedicate a song to this pregnant young lady uh, and she sang Little Sparrow, which oh. is, uh, and my wife was like crying, <laughs> like she couldn't handle it. And my wife called me from the airport in Pigeon Forge and said, I can't talk right now. I'm like too emotional, but we're naming one of our, we knew Twins. we were having daughters. We're naming one of our daughters, Dolly. That's it. I don't, I don't want to even talk about it. It's not, it's not up for, for debate. <laughs> They're like hung up. His twin daughters are 15 years old. One is interested in acting and the other modeling. He worries his daughters might become Nepo, short for nepotism babies. They might get a foot in the door because of their parents' careers. Who knows if my kids will make it in showbiz, make it in the entertainment industry, make it in modeling. Who knows? We will always make our kids work for what they want. My wife and I worked for everything that we have. We got... <laughs> You've got a lot of roles, I saw. We got uh, from our, from our, you know, we're talking about Nepo babies in particular. We got no help from our parents. I mean, they were encouraging, you know, but like, so we do have, my wife and I do have um, a, a work ethic. And listen, it's proven. You, Kenny Leon said I have a work ethic. And if Kenny Leon says you have a work ethic, you have a work ethic. Um, uh, so we will really try to instill in our Nepo baby children a uh, a work ethic. Nothing comes for free. You gotta work for everything. N the, uh, the only way you gain success is through hard work. Because if it's given to you, it doesn't, it just doesn't feel good, you know? Jerry is trying new things. Saxophone lessons and tap dancing lessons now that he's turned 50. I carry myself differently, you know, I'm, uh, so I'm not going to say I'm more confident than 50. I just, um, I like being 50. I mean, I do, you know, if I get on a plane, I am a little stiff when I get up from that seat. I mean, I do find myself chewing aspirin like they're Tic Tacs these days. So there are some aspects that, uh, I don't like, but, uh, what are you going to do? You can't stop it. You got to just have fun while you're doing it. If you would like to be a contestant on Pictionary, go to PictionaryOnTV.com. Check your local listings for the show schedule. Thank you for joining me. And don't forget to subscribe to Peachtree TV on YouTube, where you can watch all the episodes of Monica Pearson one-on-one. -on -one. Good night.